And let's finish up tables today. And we'll probably start JavaScript today. If not, we'll start that on Tuesday. All right. Um, we went over tables. And we're going to do probably three things with tables today before we finish. We're going to look at some more CSS. And we are going to look at accessibility for tables. And then we're also going to look at some sort of advanced table tags. Tags that um, you don't always need, but if you do need them, they come in handy. All right. Uh, let's see where we left off and let's review it. Here's a simple table that we had. I'll make it bigger by doing that. Um, if you remember, we have uh, in the table, we have three, actually four main tags. We have the table tag, which goes around the whole table. All right. A table is consisted of a series of rows, and the rows are in TR tags. So this one has five rows, so there's five TR tags in it. So inside the table are TRs. Inside the TRs are table cells, which table cells can either be TDs or THs. TDs is, uh, stands for table data. TH stands for table heading. All right. Uh, remember the browser does some default things to, t to THs and TDs, uh, as it does for everything, every type, the browser has some default behaviors. But uh, we can change those by writing CSS to do that. Any questions about this? Now, an accessibility issue that you run into with tables is similar to the accessibility issue that you run into with forms. All right. If you remember, in forms, people that are able to see can tell that name belongs to this, email belongs to this, because those things physically on the screen are laid out close to each other. When you have a screen reader narrating it, though, that's not always the case, and a person might not be able to tell what's next to what, because instead of seeing it, the screen reader is reading it. Well, we have something in forms that we do to make it more accessible and to make that association for people that can't see, and that is the label tag. And the label tag ties the label to the form control. All right. So it makes that association that a person that can see sort of automatically makes it without thinking based on the position of that. There's something similar to that with tables. There's a, there, there's a couple ways to do it, but probably from what I see, the best way to do it, and probably the simplest way to do it, is with a scope attribute. A scope attribute defines if something is a header for a column or a header for a row. So if I go in here and for each of these I say scope equals <coughs> column. Let me verify I'm doing this correctly. in each of these scope of column because these things are headers for 
their respective columns. All right, in other words, January is not data, right, but it's the header for this column. Likewise, Atlanta is sort of the header for that row. So I can say for the cities on the list, I can say scope equals row if I want to. And that will help a person make the association, a person that's using a screen reader, make the association with the rows and columns. So it's one thing that we do for accessibility. Another thing that we can do for accessibility is, number one, we talked about this last time, do not use a table to lay out your page. Back in the old days, people would use, would create like maybe a two by two table and put the banner in the first uh, row, first column, and put the navigation in the first row, second column, and put other stuffs in there and use that to position things. Well, we talked about not using the table tags for that. All right, so don't use the table tags to achieve the layout. The other thing to do is don't use complicated tables. For example, Let's say that this is the average high temperature, or this is the high temperature for this month. If we add another set of things to show the low temperature, make it a separate table. So rather than combining things into one table and have, you know, we could do this again. and have the first set of temperatures be the average high. We can make the second set of rows the average low. That's one table that sort of combines two themes together. You'd be better off not doing that. You'd be better off making two separate tables. So don't combine stuff into two tables. Uh, don't combine two tables into one table. If you really have two sort of different things, uh, make them separate. So keep the table simple. Now one thing that you can do in tables, and sometimes it's okay to do it, but it also sort of complicates things, is you could have, you could take data and spread it across many columns or many rows. For example, let's say just coincidentally, the average temperature in Denver was the same for January and February and March. Unlikely, right? But let's pretend. You know, maybe for other data that would be possible. If we did the average rainfall in the desert, you know, maybe that would be, maybe that would be possible. We can actually eliminate columns if we want to have one column take the place over several columns. We can say call span. And that one column can spread over multiple columns. Okay, I did this wrong. Yeah, I... Let's see, I wanted to do that. Oh, I, I, I did this. No, I, I did this wrong. Let's undo a couple times. I do this. I would say on Denver, I would say their temperature spans three columns. in which case it shows it only once and it's meant to go across for three columns. 
Um, you can do that, but that actually makes it a little more difficult from a accessibility perspective. I would probably just as well put the data in, even if it's the same three times, just to keep uh, the table simple. So make your table simple. What can you put in a table cell? You could put anything in a table cell. You could put any HTML that you want to. For example, if I had a photograph of Denver, Atlanta, Cleveland, I could put a photo of that in there. You could even put another table in there. But that's probably not a good idea. All right, That's getting back to the old days of bad web design where people put tables inside of tables to do some uh, intricate layouts. So if you wanted to show maybe Cleveland's March temperature for 2010 through 2019, you could put a little table inside of the March cell for Cleveland and have another little table that showed that. I'm telling you all these things that I'm telling you not to do them. All right? Maybe I should just not mention them. All right? But again, the... If you remember, one of the, the guidelines for uh, accessibility is keeping things simple. All the things that I've described and told you don't do them sort of complicates things and makes it a little more confusing for people with, uh, with disabilities to read. So keep your table simple. One thing per table. Don't span columns. If you, unless you absolutely have to. Don't span rows unless you absolutely have to. Don't nest tables inside the other tables. Okay? Is that, I think that's a good synopsis of accessibility for tables. Oh, and use the scope attribute. Use the scope attribute to designate the, whether uh, something is a, a header for a column or for a row. All right. Next thing that we have is we have tags that you can use um, that, that can help with the accessibility a little bit. It can also help with the styling. We can group rows together because rows of a table are either header rows, the body of the table, or footer rows. All right? If, for example, I had a summary let's say the last row of my table was an average for all cities. Okay. That's different than each individual city, right? It's sort of like, it's like a total. It's not really a total because it's not summing it up, but it's like meant to be totals for the whole four of these rows, okay? You can define sections of the table using the T-head, T-body, and T-foot tags. Again, I'm going to double check this one. T-head, T-body, and T-foot. Yep, got it right. So, in other words, I could put T-head around the first row, because the first row is the row of my headers. T-body around the next four rows. And finally, T foot around the last few. Now, this is nice for accessibility reasons. It helps further uh, divide the table and explain what the table does. But it's also cool for styling reasons as well. So, for example, instead of saying 
ID of top header, I can get rid of that, and I can put this on the T head tag. One thing that is a little bit different from how people used to do CSS in, in you know, back pre-HTML5 um, is that you tend to use far less IDs than you used to because, um, now T-head is something that's been around for a while, so T-head isn't an HTML5 thing. But with things like navigation, the, the nav tag and the header tag, head, header tag and footer tag and section tag and all that, you can use those tags to define a style. So therefore, there's less of a need to define a style for a particular ID. You will still use classes a lot. But again, I'm actually happy when I don't have to use a lot of IDs because that shows that my document is really well defined HTML wise. All right, and I didn't have to go in and stick some classes in just to make it work. So I can use that for styling purposes. And it does help from what I've read with accessibility. And I can go and style the footer a little bit different too, just to give someone an idea that the footer is different than the rest of the document. So maybe I will do B B B E B B. Alright. Made the color just a little bit different so that you can see and it stands out a little bit. That way visually you can is is not the same as the other is that Remember, a good use of style, uh, things like colors and fonts and any visual element that you have, is that things that are the same should look the same. Things that are different should look different. All right? So in other words, this row and this row are different than the other rows of the table. This is a header row. This is a footer row. Therefore, they should look different. All right, it's a good style guideline to make things that are different look different. Whereas things that are the same should look the same. All these are pretty much the same. They're a city and three temperatures. So I'm going to have all of them look the same. They're, they're, there's nothing different about any of these cities. You know. Now if I was, let's say for example, if I was from the uh, Denver tourist uh, board and I was trying to get people to come visit Denver and I really wanted to focus on Denver's temperature compared to these other cities then maybe I would make the row for Denver look a little different but in this case where it's just supposed to be like well this is some weather data you know all these rows are, are considered equal and therefore I'm going to do it that way all right questions about this so far Let's see, covered T-head, T-body, T-foot, covered, uh, covered all the things that we could but aren't going to do, uh, covered accessibility. The last thing I want to cover is some cool styling things with table. Now again, we can, we can do selectors just like we did anywhere. Remember what we have uh, at our disposal for selectors. We have HTML tags, we have classes, and we have IDs. So we can give IDs to things if there's only one per page that is going to have that ID and we want to set the style characteristics. Or if there's something that is going to be uh, linked together, if there's more than one thing. For example, if we had uh, a whole bunch of cities, let's say, and we wanted to show all the cities in Ohio with a certain color, all the cities in Michigan with a certain color, all the cities in uh, Georgia with a certain color. We could use a class for that and indicate the class of Ohio, a class of Georgia, or whatever. Now, if we did that, we probably should also put the state in the table for people that are colorblind. Right? Remember, that's an accessibility thing, to show things two different ways. So. You might say, well, I don't want to color code things 
because not everyone can distinguish colors. There might be people that are colorblind that can't see it. Well, that's not the whole truth about accessibility. If you think it would be beneficial for people that are not colorblind to color code the entries by state, then by all means do it. Just make sure there's an alternative for people that are colorblind. And in this case, you know, first of all, make sure that there's sufficient contrast between the colors so that even if they're seen monochromatically, the person can still read it, all right? But secondly, um, just be sure to show the data some other way. So if you're color coding by state, that's fine, but also include the state as one of the columns on the table. That way that someone that is not colorblind can see based on the color or can see based on the text what cities are in what state. Someone that's colorblind and can distinguish the colors, at least they can see the text that says what state things are in. All right, there's a neat thing that you can do, and this is especially true with long tables, with big tables, let's, let's put it that way. Big tables, uh, tables that have a lot of columns, tables that have a lot of rows. I'll show you it with this table, but know that it's especially beneficial with big tables. Either has a lot of rows, a lot of columns, or both. And that is you can alternate the colors of rows. All right? Back in the old days, they did that with computer paper because you'd get a computer printout that was so wide, had 132 columns going across, and it's difficult if you're looking at a solid color, your eye tends to go up or down a little bit as you move across the page. All right? Well, these lines, these grid lines, sort of help a little bit. But another thing we can do is we can alternate colors. That also helps your, your eye to stay uh, going across. So let's look up how we can do this and... Oh, this does columns. Here we go. I'm going to put this in the CSS. Do keep in mind that my CSS I have in the same file as my HTML. That is simply uh, a thing of convenience. I'm not suggesting this is a better way to do it with tables or this is a better way to do it. I just, when I made this example the other day, I was a little lazy and I didn't create a separate file. So don't start doing this on your assignments. Do it the way we have been with the CSS in a different file. Okay. So what I've done is we have TR, nth child, even. What that's going to do is that's going to make every even row have a background of pound sign CCC, which is a shade of gray. And there you go. Now, why do these rows get the different color? Because there's a rule more specific. There's a rule for the T foot and the T head, and that overrides this one. That's more specific. That's closer than the TR rule is, more specific to it. Now, we can play around this uh, too. Let's say, for example, I don't want the box going around all of them. I only want a line underneath the, the header and a line between the body and the summary at the end. How could I do that? So I want a line here, and I want a line here, and I don't want the rest of the lines. Let me get rid of the lines first. Let me get rid of all of them. Okay, I don't have any borders. Let's say I wanted a border underneath the line of headers, and I wanted a border above the footers. Yeah, 
just use bottom border and, and top border, right? So I would go in here for T head, and I would say border bottom two pixel black solid. And under this one, I would say border bottom, or that would be border top. Let's make it a little bit different just to show it. And there we have the table looking the way we want. So, with a, again, with a little bit of styling, you know, four or five lines worth of stuff. Notice how much better and complete that looks. This is with no styling. All the browser defaults kick in. All right. That works, I guess it's legible. Um, it is a table and all that, but when we put this in, not only does it look better, but it is easier to read. So it's not purely just an aesthetic thing like, oh, I like those colors, that's a nicer looking table. It is, but it's also a table that's easier to read. At a glance, you can see some things. You can see the, you see a clean separation between the headers and the data and the footer. All right, the alternating lines would mean even if this was a big table, long and wide, your eye would be sort of guided as you moved across the screen. And that's an important thing to remember um, as we look at, at styling our pages is, yes, styling exists to make it look good, make it look nicer, to evoke the mood of the website, and so on. But styling also uh, increases or ought to increase the functionality of the page, make it easier for people to see. And again, following those basic guidelines, things that are the same should look the same, things that are different should look different. All right, those kinds of things uh, go a long way in helping you decide how to style stuff. All right, because we can do overkill too. We could literally make every row in this table a different color and put different borders on every single cell, you know, and all that. Uh, that would probably neither look good, nor would it make the table more understandable. All right? Uh, so it would fail in both regards. Whereas a little bit of styling in the right places can go far into making it a much more clear, easy to understand table. Okay. Any questions about this? All right, we're done with tables. Now, we're going to get into JavaScript, and JavaScript is what we will do for the rest of the semester, other than getting your project done. JavaScript. We talked a while back about server-side scripting. We drew this diagram. look like this, where we have a client that connects to the internet, that connects to a web server, and the client makes requests. The requests make it to the appropriate web ser server using the domain name and the IP address and all that good stuff. The server gets it, does what it needs to to put together a response. In the case of plain old HTML, it simply finds the HTML files and delivers them, right? Because those are static pages. Those always look the same. In the case of server-side scripting, though, like if you did a Google search, there's a script on this end. That is, there's a... And your 
response, a response just for you, is going to take all the items that were part of your request, your location, your platform, are you Windows or Mac? If you do a search on Windows for open source software, you'll see Windows answers. Uh, if you do it on a Mac, you'll see Mac answers. And maybe data from your form, including what you're searching for. All that gets sent to, let's say, Google's web server, and there's a script that reads a database and puts together a response custom for you, all right, that takes into account all these factors and a bunch of other factors too. For example, your search history, all right. Uh, if the one example I give is there is Don Cherry in Canada who is a hockey announcer. Then there's Don Cherry, the jazz musician. Well, if you're a hockey fan and you search for Don Cherry, the hockey announcer is going to come up magically on the top of the list. Whereas if you're a jazz fan and you've always been doing searching on jazz musicians, you search for Don Cherry, you're going to get the jazz musician on the top of your list. If you haven't done, if you haven't really established yourself as either, you might get a mix of those two, depending on who's more popular worldwide. All right, so you get a response back that was custom made for you, made on the fly. So if someone added a new website a few days ago and it's in their database, you might get different responses than if you did the same search a couple days back because people are always adding, updating, and so on websites. So this response, the script assembles stuff from the database, has programming logic and all that, and produces its output in HTML5. All right? That's a key point to remember with server-side scripting. When the day is done, you're getting back an HTML document because that's what browsers understand. All right? So it doesn't matter if it's a completed static web page or if it's a server-side scripted page where the result is prepared just for you right there. You're getting back an HTML page. Okay. That's what we covered before when we were talking about forms. And, and we said we're going to study, we're not going to study server-side scripting, but we're going to study this part, how we can give the web server form data that it can use in preparing our response. Now, this HTML document contains other stuff too. All right. Namely, CSS, JavaScript, and some other files. And we already saw what HTML is. That's the content of the page. CSS is the appearance. What is JavaScript then? It provides behavior or interactivity. Here's the observation that people made in the early days of the internet. We need the web server to do the heavy lifting. All right, we need the web server to access databases and run server-side scripts and do things like that to prepare a web page. It would be, take your pick, impossible. I hesitate to say impossible because nothing's impossible, but it would be not a good idea to try to do that on the client side. It would be difficult to do. It, there would be security issues. Um, it wouldn't be very practical. It would increase the requirements on the client side. Just overall would be a bad idea if this stuff, you tried to do that on the client computer. Because remember, both these things, the client and the server, are typically both computers. All right? So the client on the other end can do some work too. All right? So the web server can do some work and the client can do some work. And here's how the work sort of got divided. All right? The heavy lifting, making these web pages on the fly based on the user's request gets done on the server side because that's where it makes the most sense to have the database interactivity and all that kind of stuff. 
All right. If you had to connect, the web server might have to connect, for example, to a credit bureau to see, like, do you, you know, it was your credit card reported stolen? Uh, you know, are you over your limit? And so on. All right. So the server has a lot of work to do. So it's better that the heavy lifting happens in the, on the server side. But there's some things that we can do on the client side that can really improve the user's experience. And that is things like interactivity. It's not necessarily the heavy lifting, but it's really good to be able to do some of the processing on the client side because of this. If I make a request to a web server, that's relatively a long time. Again, we have fast, we're spoiled these days, right? We have fast internet connections. But in computers, time frame to make a request through the internet, have a web server address it, and respond to it, still takes a little bit of time. All right? If I can do something on this machine, that takes virtually no time. That happens, I don't want to say instantaneously, but nearly instantaneously. Because all the stuff's here. All I'm doing is I'm running a few instructions over on this machine. I don't have to go and ask the server to do something and get the results back. All right? This is the equivalent, if we're going to continue the uh, restaurant analogy, of the fact that they give you salt and ketchup when they give you your sandwich. Right? Because you can handle that. Right? Could you imagine every time you made a request I want more salt on my fries, that you had to get a waiter to come and sprinkle some salt on your fries. Everyone in the world would hate that, right? The server certainly wouldn't enjoy it. The restaurant wouldn't like it, because salt, after all, is not that expensive. It's not that big of a security risk that someone's going to run off with a whole bunch of salt, all right? And you would hate it because you'd have to wait a long time to get your request answered. So what we have done is we've written some functionality that comes with the web page that can happen and execute virtually instantaneously and everyone's happier. The client gets a faster results. Does that wait for the server? And the server isn't bothered for these little requests. Okay, so what are some of the kinds of functionalities we do? A lot of them are the things that make the web page interactive. By interactive I mean you do something and the web page responds. All right? For example, a classic example of this that we'll take a look at in a minute is mouse over menus. If I put my mouse over a link, sometimes a menu will appear. All right? A sub menu will appear. Now, there's a bunch of ways that you can do that. All right? But JavaScript or client side scripting, which are sort of synonymous, the scripting, the code is on the client side, and it's done in the language JavaScript. All right. Can manipulate a web page that's already been created. So yeah, we need the server to do the heavy lifting, to create the web page based on some rules and data in a database and all that. But to do little tweaks to the page, JavaScript code can do that just as well as anything on the server side, and again, with the extra benefit that it happens instantaneously. So, let's look at a couple examples of client-side code. So I go to ESPN, all right, <coughs> notice what I have. This is probably done with server-side scripting for a couple reasons. For one thing, notice it guessed that I, if I'm, I would probably be a fan of Ohio State the Cavaliers, and the Columbus Blue Jackets. 
All right, it's not a coincidence, right? Those are all Ohio teams. All right. Plus, all these things are like up to date, right? I mean, this as things change throughout the day. Apparently, it's the NFL draft day or something. I don't know, but apparently, these things are going to change, and it's going to change without someone, some web developer, sitting there with their ear to the phone. Oh, who did the Browns get? Okay, let's type that in and change the HTML page. All right. So this was put together with CS with uh, server side scripting. So what got sent back to the client? HTML got sent back. So here's some links. That got sent back. CSS to say make the links not have underlines in it, make it blue when you mouse over. That got sent back. But also got sent back with some JavaScript. Because if I put my mouse over here, notice I get a menu. I take my mouse off, it disappears. Now, I can say pretty sure that that's happening client-side. Why? Because that happens virtually instantaneously. All right? I don't have to sit there and wait. Notice that even on a very quick Internet connection, the page flickers a little bit. All right? It doesn't immediately go and refresh. All right? You can see the page being drawn. Whereas this... So I put my mouse over these things, there's no delay at all. All right? So let's analyze what's happening here. What's happening here is when I request this page, it goes to the web server. It knows some information about me. It has a, a general idea of where I'm located. I'm located somewhere in Ohio. So it's going to give me the Cavaliers, Ohio State, the Columbus Blue Jackets. All right? It probably knows the time of the year, right? Because basketball is winding down. Uh, hockey is winding down. Um, I don't know why Ohio State's in there. Because um, basketball and football are over. But still, Ohio State's really popular in this area. Okay. So it gave me all that. It gave me all the HTML. So it gave me the links and the images and all that stuff. It gave me HTML that you see and HTML that you do not see. So all those menus that are up there, it gave me the HTML for those. It just made them hidden. All right. How do you make things hidden? We saw how to make things hidden before when we did CSS. What we are doing essentially is when we put our mouse over here, we have interactivity. And what do I mean by interactivity? I mean you do something, and the page responds to it. What happens when we put our mouse over it? It simply makes those menus visible. We take our mouse off of it, it makes those things invisible. All right? That, in a nutshell, is sort of the recipe for JavaScript. It's used most of the time to manipulate an existing web page. And it's used to change some attributes of the web page. In this case, we're changing the visibility of the menus based on if the user takes the action to put their mouse on something or remove their mouse from that. All right. Next time we'll get into the details of how this happens, what JavaScript looks like, and how that happens. But I want to be really sure on the concept of it before we go ahead. All right. Any questions? Alrighty, I will go unlock the lab, come get my files.